Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, the 22nd of July, 2019, the 19th of Tammuz 5779. Thanks so much for joining us here in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. We're going to go right to the phone right now. And uh, Mark Zell, who's been on the show before, Chairman of the Republican Overseas here in Israel, also the Vice President and General Counsel of Republicans Overseas Worldwide. He joins us now on the line. Mark, welcome back to Israel Uncensored. Great to be uh, with you, Josh. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, Mark. I I want to start with there's a lot of activity out of the U.S. administration, a lot of things going on politically. Uh, I want to start with uh, President Trump and some of the tweets which he's been sending out. And particularly, let's start with the one he sent out um, yesterday congratulating Prime Minister Netanyahu on becoming the longest serving PM in the history of Israel. Uh, Trump said, under your leadership, Israel has become a technology powerhouse and a world-class economy. Most importantly, you have led Israel with commitment to the values of democracy, freedom, and equal opportunity that both our nations cherish and share. Mark, if you could comment, please, on that tweet. I don't think President Trump uh, sends tweets like this to every world leader. Well, I can't comment on that, Josh, but I can say that uh, the as, as Prime Minister Netanyahu said in response to that tweet, uh, uh, the relationship between the United States and Israel has never been stronger. We have uh, in both of these leaders uh, a real example of what it is to stand up to to terror and to tyranny. Uh, both at home and abroad, and I uh, cannot b- be more grateful than I am to to, to say to, to see that uh, Donald Trump uh, recognizes uh, the leadership here in Israel. Of course, we have elections coming, and the president doesn't want to interfere with those elections. But uh, the facts are are the facts, and uh, the relationship is strong and dynamic, and promises to be even more so. At the same time, about eight hours before that uh, tweet, the president once again going after the squad, I believe as they're called, the four congresswomen uh, who I have no problem calling out as anti-Israel, as anti-Semites, saying that uh, I don't believe the four congresswomen are capable of loving our country. They should apologize to America and Israel for the horrible, hateful things they have said. They are destroying the Democrat, uh, Democrat Party. But are weak and insecure people who cannot, who can never destroy our great nation. What is your take on this back and forth, I guess, Twitter spat or Twitter battle between the president and these four freshman congresswomen, who we know over the last uh, several months and even longer have said some pretty nasty things about Israel and about Jews. Yeah. Well, first of all, the president's absolutely correct in calling them down on their their hatred uh, and their bigotry uh, towards the Jewish people and their hatred towards Israel. Um, what you asked about this, uh, you called it a spat on Twitter. Well, it's a little bit more than that. What's going on, Josh, is you've got this radical progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party that's more or less hijacked the Democratic Party. And I, as a Republican, I and, and I think the president echoed these uh, sentiments, uh, I mean, we're, it's a tragic thing, and it's not something we are happy to see. Uh, you know, we don't agree with the Democrats on everything, but in the past, there's been a bipartisan support for Israel and a bipartisan support for the Jewish people. Uh, in fact, most American Jews vote Democratic, and that's uh, as amazing as that may be in these days. But, but, uh, but what the president is doing here, and I have to give him a credit for, he has an uncanny ability to do this. Is he? He has seen the uh, the what's happening in the Democratic Party, and he's trolling them. He's trolling the Democratic Party because they have gone out on a limb and embraced this racist card that these uh, squad members uh, are, are are perpetrating, and they keep doing it. And you you can read the it's not only these squad members, but leaders in the Democratic Party and. Almost every one of their presidential candidates are coming out and 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 calling uh, the president a racist, a xenophobe, a misogynist, and just calling him names from 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 A to Z at every opportunity. 
and yet he is the most successful president in probably the last 50 years or more and has done more for the Afro-American community and the Hispanic community in terms of unemployment and economic, uh, 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 un economic advancement than any president in history. And yet they, they keep calling him down on this. And I think the president understands that this is going to be their undoing in the 2020 elections. And he keeps egging them on and forcing them to, to embrace this. It's a big mistake on their part. The president's only going to be the winner. So as it ties into Israel here, you have Ilian Omar and Rashida uh, Tlaib, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. They actually uh, are scheduled to visit Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Of course, after last week uh, putting out a, uh, a, a, I would call it a pro-BDS resolution in Congress, and now they say they're coming here to Israel, and there's a debate going on that I've seen all over the place uh, whether or not Israel should allow these two congresswomen into the country. So I want to know your take, whether you think it would be more, more beneficial for Israel to let them in and to go and see the sites and to visit with people, or do you think as um, I, at, at this current state, I believe, I think because Israel has a as a law essentially barring all BDS members from coming into the country, should they be banned from coming into Israel? What's your take on this? Well, I've I've come out very strongly on this, Josh. If you've been following me on uh, Twitter, you would see this. Uh, look, I understand that they're coming part of as part of a larger delegation of freshman congressmen to Israel, and I think the visits of that sort are really important. Uh, but in the case of these two individuals, I believe that they, it would be a terrible mistake for Israel to allow them entry because of their anti-Semitic and their pro-BDS positions. They will only make a, make a, 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 take advantage of their a platform that they're going to have here. All of the attention of the media will be on them, and they're going to, they're going to make a, a mince, uh, mincemeat out of Israel. This is a big mistake. But Israel, as I understand it, has decided to let them in. I, I think it's a huge mistake. I've said it uh, many times. I understand the reasons for doing it out of respect for the United States Congress. But these congressmen have shown no respect for Israel, for the Jewish people, and for the basic values that our country share. I, there's uh, there are people have been contacting me in terms of and I, again I agree with you I don't think they should be allowed in people have been contacting me asking me what is the best way to protest uh, Israel's apparent decision that they're letting them in where is the address for people's uh, protest meaning should people be standing outside Prime Minister Netanyahu's house is it the Interior Ministry um, I believe I'm not sure who the minister is at this time with all the turnover with all the changes um, I'm not sure who it is or is it Gilad Erdan who happens to be Israel's representative targeting the, the BDS I mean where's the address in order to voice opinions oh i think it's aria daria by the way where uh the interior ministry yes. where, where where do we voice uh, our uh our uh feelings over the fact that we do not believe those of us do not believe that they should be allowed into the country where's the target address well i think the target address uh, is uh, is with the prime minister this is his call <laughs> i mean it's true that the interior ministry they uh, they control immigration into the country, but this is a call that's coming from the prime minister's office. I don't want to be overly critical of him. I understand why he's doing it. I think it's as I said, it's a mistake. And <clears throat> I think the address uh, for public discontent with that decision is with him. Now, I'm not a strong uh, believer in street protests, and I think they would send the wrong message, particularly when you know when. Uh, uh, the, the press is going to be here in huge numbers covering this and focusing on these squad members. I think this would be uh, this would be a big a big mistake to go out in there because they're just going to show those pictures and and that's not going to reflect well on Israel. I think the place to do this uh, is through the social media today. That has a huge uh, impact, and the more people that get on Facebook or Twitter or whatever uh, social media platform you use. Uh, to express their discontent in massive numbers, I think that's the place, and I and I hope I hope uh, the Israeli leadership will will pay attention to that and will decide accordingly because it would be I think they're going to be they're going to come up with uh, very bloodied after after this visit. 
Yeah, again, I, I am just you know, baffled as to why they're being allowed in, even though they are congresswomen. But we'll see what happens at the end of the day. And just one more question, Mark, switching gears here. There was a front page article in yesterday's Jerusalem Post saying that uh, Jason Greenblatt, special envoy for uh, the Middle East here out of the administration, he says, uh, according to this report, the U.S. is not weighing a one-state solution. That is the, the headline here, uh, quote being quoted as saying, our plan does not contemplate one state, he said. I think if it did, we would have released it over two years ago. I am not sure that there are many people that think that one state is good for either side. Again, I don't know the context of these comments, but I want to know from you, um, you know, are, are you concerned in any way about uh, Jason Greenblatt saying that potentially the U.S. is not aiming for a one state solution? I mean, I guess I'm not saying this this shows that he that a two state solution, th therefore, um, by process of elimination is what they're aiming for. But just are you concerned by these comments from uh, the administration on this? Well, Josh, let me be quite clear about this. I'm not concerned, and I've never been concerned about uh, the uh, so-called deal of the century, whatever it may came, contain. And the reason I'm not, Josh, is that in the end of the day, and I think we've seen this over and over again, uh, the Ameri this American administration will do nothing, will do nothing uh, uh, to force Israel to... Uh, accept a solution or an approach that Israel, the Israeli government, feels it's against the national security interests of Israel. I mean, that is the sea change that has occurred in this administration. It could be the Americans will propose this plan or another plan. We've seen these plans come and go. But, but in the end of the day, that's the big difference, and that's why I'm not particularly concerned about it. We don't know... It's exactly in the political side of the, of the administration's plan. We won't know, according to them, until after the Israeli elections in September. But whatever is in it, whether it's one state, two states, one and a half states, you know, God knows there have been a million propositions. In the end of the day, Washington will not force the Israeli government to take action against what the Israeli government's feel is its national security interest. And this means... This is what it means. This is really important for the Israeli electorate coming in uh, uh, towards the uh, September election date. And that is, it's up to us. The meaning of this new American policy towards Israel is that Israel must decide. The policy of the Israeli government is going to be function initially and properly of the will of the Israeli voters. And that's what's going to be decided in September. If the Israeli voters send a clear message about what they want the Israeli government to do, then come uh, after the election and, uh, and a coalition is formed, uh, that is what the Israeli government should be doing. And the American government will respect that. But that's a, So that means each of us, Josh, each of us that has a vote in Israel, has to vote as if you know this is the most important vote of our life because... We'll never have an administration in Washington like we've had uh, uh, during the past two years and hopefully the, past, the next six. Well, Mark, when you are uh, not concerned, when you're confident, it always adds to my confidence. So I'm glad to hear that and I appreciate it. Mark Zell, we are out of time. Chairman of Republican Overseas in Israel, also the Vice President and General Counsel of Republicans Overseas Worldwide. Check out his posts on Twitter and social media to get the latest from uh, Republicans here in Israel and around the world. I want to thank you so much for your time and your analysis, and let's continue to hear good things. And uh, only the best. Have a great summer, and uh, let's let's talk again as we get closer to the uh, the Israeli election, if we can. Well, Josh, it's always a pleasure to be with you, and maybe you have a great summer too. And uh, an easy three weeks uh, coming up. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Bye. We're going to take a short break right now, come back with the news. You're listening to Israel Uncensored here on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. My name is Josh Haston. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston or my Facebook page, Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and
journalism on Twitter at Josh Hastman and now on Instagram as well. Don't touch that dial. We're going to come right back with all the latest news out of Israel. We'll be right back. Thanks so much. No nation on earth more mirrors the United States in its origin and in its experience as Israel does. This week on Rejuvenation with Eve Harrow, an exclusive interview with former Governor Mike Huckabee, who visited Israel, including the headquarters of the Land of Israel Network. Israel is a country that, like the origins of the United States, was created by people who came here to escape tyranny. And one reason that every American should be adamant that Israel have its land is because the Holocaust would never have happened had there been a Jewish homeland. Check out this exclusive interview on Rejuvenation with Eve Harrow on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. And we are back. Josh Haston here. Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It's Monday, the 22nd of July, 2019. The 19th of Tammuz, 5779. And now we will get to the news. Thank God for this. Honestly, this could have been a horrible, horrible disaster. Uh, who knows how many people would have been killed. A Rahat citizen was arrested for planning to bomb an Ashdod hotel. This reported by the Jerusalem Post, a resident of the Bedouin town of Rahat has been indicted in a Beersheba district court on suspicion of planning a mega terror attack against an Ashdod hotel. Israel security agency, the Shin Bet, reported yesterday. The Shin Bet, in cooperation with the police, arrested 20-year-old Adel Abu Hadayeb from Rahat in June after he purchased materials to make a homemade explosive. He was a Hamas supporter, arrested with five hand grenades and a submachine gun. This could have been a disaster. This terrorist wannabe or would-be terrorist wanting to blow up a, an Ashdod hotel. He began to support Hamas after he was exposed to the group's propaganda on the Internet. And for all, all, those, all those out there who don't believe that words matter, or the things that uh, the Hamas and other terror organizations post on the internet, it does matter, it does make a difference, it does influence. We know the Palestinian Authority promotes the hate of Jews and expresses their desire to destroy the state of Israel in their official textbooks used in schools for children. And here's just another example of that. This guy was influenced by the internet, decided he was going to prepare a bomb, carry out an attack, in the city of Ashdod. So thank God he was caught. Also, he was preparing to <clears throat> make a, uh, a rocket that he was going to launch at an Israeli town. So thank God for that. At the same time, down there in Gaza, Qatar delivers more cash to Gaza as part of this truce, if you want to call it that, between Israel and Hamas, which I still don't understand. On Saturday, Qatar delivered another cash grant reported by the J Post to the Gaza Strip, paving the way for the distribution of payments to Arab families there, according to sources in Gaza. The Qatari grant was delivered thanks to media mediation efforts made by Egypt and the UN in past days. Why do we keep allowing money into uh, Gaza from Qatar? How do we know the money is going to the families? That's first of all. And either way, Either way, letting this money in enables Hamas to keep on ruling. The residents there need to step up and get rid of Hamas. And when they're given these payments, they then decide, well, Hamas is doing this for us. Why should we make any noise? Ultimately, I believe, unless Israel carries out a major military operation to overthrow Hamas, which at this point I'm not a fan of sending any soldiers, any idea of soldiers into Gaza, especially if it means destroying Hamas and replacing Hamas with the, with the Palestinian Authority. I'm not for that at all. I'd rather see the people there overthrow their regime, but it has to get bad for them to a point where they're willing to do so. And allowing the money in, even if some of it goes to the families, 
just enables Hamas, allows these people to think that life is okay under Hamas's rule, and this ultimately is bad for Israel. At the same time, and this is Hamas, Hamas really is, a Hamas official in, in the Gaza Strip, according to the J-Post, said that his movement was currently seeking to improve its relations with Iran and restore ties with Syria. And we're letting them survive. These are our terrorists backed by Iran. They had a little bit of a falling out, falling out there, but they would like to restore order with Iran, with Syria. That's who these people are. And it's, of course, ironic because uh, Hamas being a Sunni, offshoot of the Muslim, bro Muslim Brotherhood terror organization in Iran being Shia. Nevertheless, when it comes to wanting to destroy Israel, to murder as many, as many Jews and Israelis as possible, they're willing to overlook those differences in order to attempt to do so. Stop enabling Hamas Israel. It is not in our best interests to allow Hamas to continue to rule down in Gaza. And here's also an article I saw in the Jerusalem Post, and, and the question I'm, I'm asking, reading the headline, Jihadists Rape, Stone, Armenian to Death in Syria. Where is the United Nations on the story? Where is the anti-Israel hate group, if not now, who claim to be all about human rights? All those who claim to care about innocent lives, there are crickets here over this story. Uh, Islamic terrorists, I'll get to it, from the jihadist organization uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, raped and stoned to death an Armenian in the Syrian province of uh, Idlib. Christian and human rights groups reported over last week that Susan Der, Der uh, Kikor, 60 years old, was found dead outside of a village. Um, she was apparently a, a Christian. An autopsy revealed that she was tortured and raped. Uh, for a period of nine hours and then stoned to death. So these are the jihadists in Syria. Yet if you're a Jew living in Judea and want to build a pergola, the UN will have an emergency Security Council uh, session or General Assembly session on Thanksgiving Day. But when it comes to other people, if Israel's not involved, it does not garner that media attention. Where are all the groups? Where are all the human rights groups? going crazy over the fact that this woman was tortured and murdered, this Christian living up there in, in Syria. Crickets, people. Crickets on this story. Uh, turning to our uh, anti-Semitism, apparently, you know, it's often a weekly anti-Semitism report. Uh, the Times of Israel says that a report was released indicating that nearly, get this, nearly half of young European Jews are, were victims of anti-Semitism in the past year. 50%. This is an outrageous number. It's insane. It's not surprising, really, but it's insane. It says here nearly half of young Jewish Europeans have been the victim of at least one, at least one anti-Semitic incident in the past year. Newly published findings um, from a survey reveal. The research also suggests that young Jews in Europe are particularly likely to believe that they are accused or blamed by people in their countries for the actions of the Israeli government because they are Jewish. 85% of 16 to 34 year olds surveyed said this happens to them at least occasionally. Nearly one quarter said it occurs all the time. All the time. People, Jews in Europe being blamed for the policies of Israel. And you should be able as a Jew to live freely anywhere in the world, Europe included, but I say, with all due respect, get out of Europe if you are Jewish. Come home to Israel now. And things aren't perfect here. And my next story will demonstrate that there's anti-Semitism here as well. But you need to get out of Europe as soon as possible. Why are you still there? Get out of Europe. 50% of young Jews in Europe experienced anti-Semitism of last year. That is insane. So I mentioned anti-Semitism here in Israel. It does exist. The Jewish press reports that there was Arab graffiti found on the Kotel HaKatan. That's the little western wall. And it, uh, the graffiti written, it was found, I believe, on Sunday yesterday, said, Slaughter the Jews. And from what I understand, several people were arrested um, and questioned on this uh, desecration of the Kotel HaKatan. 
the Jewish press reports, a section of the Kotel Katan, the little western wall in the what is called the Muslim quarter of the old city of Jerusalem, desecrated by Arabs over Shabbat. The vandals spray-painted the ancient stones um, with Arabic graffiti curses, urging the reader to slaughter the Jews. And for those who don't know, the sanctity, sanctity of the small western wall equals that of the regular western wall, according to the Jewish press here. And in fact, this section is considered to be the second closest possible place to the Holy of Holies on the Temple Mount um, uh, that is accessible to the public 24-7. Obviously, the uh, Temple Mount not always accessible to Jews, and Jews cannot pray up there on the Temple Mount. The closest section of the Western Wall to the Holy of Holies is actually inside the Western Wall tunnels. And um, again, asking where is the media coverage, if this was reversed, if a crazy Jew wrote uh, some nasty things about Arabs, uh, put up some graffiti. This would be front page on the New York in the New York Times and in other publications. Where is the media? And I just encourage you to make Aliyah. Okay, so you might turn around and say, well, there is anti-Semitism here in Israel as well. The only difference is, is we have 24-7 uh, a group called the IDF and the rest of the security forces who are here to protect us when, whether it's this type of graffiti or whether it's actual violence, we have the backing of our young men and women who give the best years of their lives in order to protect the residents of the Jewish state of Israel. And that is the difference. And that is what you do not have in Europe. You may have security forces and police and your uh, local uh, or regional armies in all of these different various countries, but you do not have the IDF looking out for the interests of Jews all over this country and all over the world. So that is why I say, even though we have our problems here, the time to come home to Israel is now. And that is exactly what 200 immigrants did just the other day, kicking off the Aliyah season reported by the TPS news agency. 200 Olim immigrants arrived in Israel last Wednesday from France, Russia, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, aboard special flights organized by the Jewish Agency for Israel. The two biggest groups of Alim came from France and Russia. 100 from France, 80 from Russia. 70 children also were amongst those who made Aliyah and getting their start off in the Israeli education system when school starts on September the 1st. There was a festive reception at Ben Gurion Airport and uh, hosted by the Jewish Agency, the Ministry of Aliyah and Integration, and Karen Hayasod, United Israel Appeal. So that's great news. Come home to Israel, people. This is the place to be. And one final news item for today, another reason to be proud to be living here in the Jewish state, to be proud of our uh, young Israelis competing in international competitions. And I actually watched uh, most of this game last night. The Israel under-20 basketball team, national basketball team, defeated Spain in the finals of the European Championship. Again, this is the under-20 winning. This is uh, a back-to-back -back win. Israel won the tournament last year as well. Um, the final score last night against uh, the, uh, the Spanish team was 92-84. The game took, uh, took place in Tel Aviv, uh, capturing the team's second straight title. We should all be proud of the under-20 European Championship. Apparently, there's some really amazing players on this team. Uh, the MVP of the game, uh, Denny uh, Avdija, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, some believe that he will actually be Israel's next NBA prospect. He was the most valuable player of the tournament. It was just amazing to see the blue and white celebrating a victory, victory in international competition last night. Israel, the Israeli men winning the under-20 European Basketball Championship. That's going to do it for today. Big shout-out to Benjamin Bresky for all the work he does in getting these shows put together and to Tabitha Epstein as well. My name is Josh Haston. This is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com for Monday, the 22nd of July, 2019, the 19th of Tammuz, 5779. You get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston, or check out my page, Josh Haston, Israel Advocacy and Journalism, on Twitter, at Josh Haston, and now on Instagram as well. Most importantly, 
Between now and when we talk again, please, God, next Monday, everyone in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Have a great week from another beautiful day here in Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Shalom, shalom. Zionism, political and secular, says Ben-Gurion, held that Israel must be redeemed by its own efforts and by natural agency, that the Jewish people on its own must create the foundations of a new life. Well, I'm definitely looking to found a new life for my people in the land, although I'm not so sure we can do it on our own. Because I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network,